objective was to protect, prevent the occurrence of make progress on cleaning up existing vessels. So, you know, a lot needs to happen to make that happen. Uh, first, like I said, it was enacted. Um, a key thing is uh, that I'll talk about a little later is identifying owners of vessels. You know, in order for us to have any sort of enforcement action, we need to have a registered owner. So that's something I think is, is a room for improvement over time. Trying to come up with short-term funding, develop a, a long-term fund um, that is growing so that we can address these vessels over time and then establishing you know, what vessels are out there and, and uh, picking away at getting them out of the marine environment. So what do we mean? Uh, as you are well aware, vessels of concern are all over Canada, um, you know, thousands. What are the, the impacts to marine habitat, species, cultural lands for First Nations, harvesting areas, um, lots of implications. And when we talk about vessels of concern, we're talking about wrecks, uh, dilapidated, abandoned, hazardous, and obstruction to navigation or a hazard to navigation. The reason, the reason I clarify these terms is that they do have different meaning for um, both Coast Guard and uh, Transport Canada, who are the two federal departments involved in this uh, act. So how does it work? Um, when you call in a vessel to our 1-800 number, which I'll, I'll highlight later, um, first, um, the Coast Guard looks at it from a search and rescue perspective. Are there lives in danger? Is there someone um, that needs to be saved? What is the situation with the vessel? Once that has been ruled out, it then goes over to our environmental response group. And that's the group that's primarily looking at um, pollution in terms of hydrocarbons or oil and gas um, and or any uh, uh, deleterious substances. So um, once that has been removed, typically it then falls over to the Vessels of Concern program, which is where we are. And that's for things like, a, let's say a sailing vessel, things that um, where oil and hydrocarbons are not the primary concern. So on the Coast Guard side, we look at the Vessels of Concern from um, a hazardous vessel perspective, and I'll define hazard in a minute, but that's really how we do our assessment. We also promote this single window approach. That's the 1-800 number um, that you call in. And what we mean by single window is that the Coast Guard will assess it and then it will go over to the Transport Canada side. And the reason for that is, is the level of urgency along this, these arrows at the top. So once our hazard assessment, if it's not deemed to be uh, an immediate hazard, then it would be transferred to Transport Canada and where it be looked at from the abandoned vessels perspective, derelict vessels. Um, they also have the uh, authority for registration of vessels and um, the abandoned boats program. So as I said, the vessels of concern piece is between Coast Guard and transport. We're looking at hazards. They're looking at uh, abandoned hazard vessels, uh, abandoned and dilapidated. The only other thing that Coast Guard has on the VOC side is if it's in a small craft harbor, so a DFO small craft harbor, then we would deal with the dilapidated vessels as well. So, I mean, I, I hear myself, even as I'm talking, I know it's pretty confusing, which is why we basically just go with the, the call it in and we'll figure it out. We'll put it through the process is, is the take home here. So what does that look like? Call comes in, um, like I said, is there an immediate navigational issue? Sometimes we get calls in, it's, it's on the ferry um, route. So it, is the ferry gonna make contact? Uh, if that's the case right away, we're gonna need to get someone out there and try and get a line on it. Um, if that's not the case, then we go like what I talked about earlier, hydrocarbons, is it a hazard? If it's not a hazard. Is it then, has it been, this is sort of getting into the Transport Canada side. I don't know if you can see these uh, icons on the bottom, but has it been a drift? So the definition under the WAVA Act is, has it been a drift for 48 hours? Is it dilapidated Iraq? And is it abandoned? Another piece that Coast Guard deals with for vessels of concern um, under part one of the act is a hazard that results from a maritime casualty. So a good example, recent one that you probably all are aware of is the Zim Kingston vessel fire uh, that happened just off of Constance Bank there in Victoria. Um, so as you're aware, I'm sure the containers, uh, the, the Zim Kingston ran into some rough weather uh, just at the entrance of the state, uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca, lost some containers overboard. 
then came to Anchorage at Constance Bank and then some of the containers caught on fire. So in that case, um, the Vessels of Concern program deals with the cargo, so the containers. And so we went up and uh, worked with Environment Canada to do trajectory modeling um, and they accurately predicted that they anticipate some of these containers would come ashore up near Cape Scott, North Vancouver Island. This is one of those vessels, uh, as you can see, numerous refrigerators all along here. So we did work with the vessel owner um, to ensure that that was all cleaned up and we continue to do so. Now, the second part of the act uh, deals with what I was talking about hazards. So the def this is the definition of a hazard when we are assessing it, um, it, when you call something in, say, from Shoal Harbor. So is it reasonably expected to result in harmful consequences to the environment, coastlines, shorelines, infrastructure, or other interests, including health and safety, well-being, and economic interests of the public? So the more information you can give us about these details, the better. It's difficult to know where every sensitive habitat is uh, for the entire coast of Canada, let alone Western Canada, which our region goes all the way to the border of Manitoba and Ontario and includes all navigable waters. So um, any information you have uh, that builds a case that this is a hazard uh, by those standards, that is helpful information for us. And as I stated earlier, if it's a dilapidated vessel, basically not uh, capable of, of uh, going under her own power, um, and it's degraded to a significant uh, state and it's in um, a small craft harbor that also would fall under our purview. And what can we do about it? So if we have reasonable grounds to believe that it may pose a hazard, we can take measures to prevent, eliminate the hazard. Um, that can mean, you know, if it's adrift, we can, we can anchor it and try and find the owner. We can, um, we can, remove it from the marine environment and sell it, we can destroy it, um, or we can monitor measures and work with the owner to mitigate uh, the hazard. How we do that is by, first the, the report comes in, we have to initially try and identify who is the owner, is there an owner? And this is the part that I'm sure um, everyone gets frustrated on your end. You're thinking you reported it, why aren't they doing anything? And what we're doing most likely is trying to track down an owner um, and trying to get them to uh, provide proof that they are the owner so that we can take measures because we do need, um, according to the act, to give 30 days notice um, to try and identify an owner. So that's another uh, limiting time constraint we have. With that, uh, we try and work with them to remove the hazard. Often as you're aware, that doesn't happen. And then we need to get to the point where we can either issue a direction um, and that's that 30 days where we're waiting and then we can take the measures. Um, in getting the measures, we need to establish funding. We need to sometimes uh, go through the contracting process. Um, so all this takes time. So it's a graduated approach, trying to communicate with people throughout uh, working to collaborate and escalate as necessary to take action. We're also continually building the inventory of the vessels that have been around for you know, decades that haven't been dealt with and that we're now trying to, to continue to remove uh, over time. So there's a lot of large vessels along the coast. Some of these you may recognize. These are up in Prince Rupert. Um, and so these large vessels, we need to go through contracting process. So this is all happening along with dealing with the stuff that's coming in every day, just so that you're aware. And we do have a computer system where we input information and it gives us sort of a risk score um, based on the hazard assessment um, for those various factors that are defined under hazard. Uh, things like this one, the barge that's sitting on Kitts Beach, um, that's something we need to do, conduct an assessment on. Um, this one actually went over to Transport Canada the owner wanted to refloat it. Now it's looking like it's not going to be refloated. It's going to be dismantled. And um, the other thing to be cognizant of is that if it's a liveaboard vessel, and I know this is a, a big sticking issue, but if someone is living on these vessels, we um, are not able to to take to go on board the vessel and to, you know, remove it with a, unless it is like immediate hazard of uh, falling apart, like this one. You can see 
uh, as we pulled it out, it just basically fell apart. And, and that's unfortunate. And I know it's frustrating for everyone, but we do need to um, be sensitive to the fact that it is someone's belonging and they do, they are living in the, the um, vessel. Some of the challenges that we have, uh, I've spoke about them already, but trying to figure out who is the, the registered vessel owner and is, the, is it licensed? Um, Transport Canada has now required that to happen as of 2019, um, getting everyone on board and all of those vessels that have been around for decades into that inventory and registered will take time. The more we can promote that, the quicker we can uh, you know, remove the hazard because we can identify who owns it and um, also it enables us to take enforcement action. So that's, like I said, something that uh, is a key. I talked about the procurement process, the contracting, it takes time. We have to go through a transparent process by the Government of Canada, ensure that the bidding goes out to everyone. Um, there, we struggle with trying to find the, the, enough industry to break down some of the vessels. So where to store um, them sometimes is also uh, complicated. Always seeking more funding. There's never enough funding. There's always more boats than money. Um, and then we only have four officers that are working on this. So um, finally, recycling facilities. So where can we send these? A lot of uh, fiberglass is not easy to recycle. Not a lot of facilities that do that. Here's the 1-800 number I spoke about. If you don't already know it, it's a 24 seven number. Um, and so we can, uh, that's where you report anything. If you do have follow-up um, information like a, a photo or something, um, they'll provide you with an email to, to send that in. Um, the reason they don't just go with the email is because uh, you know things can get missed. They wanna, by calling in, uh, what happens is the person on the other end of the line is creating a file number which starts the whole process for the vessel. So another thing that a lot of times people want to do is send us a list of a whole bunch of vessels in their community and the reason we we stick with this process of calling them in is because then we are creating the files and systematically looking at each vessel independently. So this is just a, a bit of a sheet. Um, when, if you are reporting a vessel, some of the things that are helpful is if you have any identification information, color, uh, number on the side of the hull, obviously. Um, photos, if you see that it's got a big gash or a big hole in the side, if you can take a photo of that, um, because sometimes it's not always apparent. Any information about the sensitivity of the environment, like you mentioned, um, this is a migratory bird area, highly sensitive. And then sometimes it comes in and it's not immediately a hazard. Um, it's just looking pretty, um, you know, pretty rough shape. But um, the, so that typically may not meet the, the definition of a hazard by our standards. And we would pass that to Transport Canada for their abandoned um, uh, perspective. But then um, if you see any change, like you see, okay, now it's taking on water, you see it's starting to list. If you pour, call that in again, we still have the file. We're still keeping it active. It's just not at the top of the list. So continuing to report any changes um, in the condition of the vessel is super helpful. And then um, just communicating with the officer if they call. And then, um, yeah, monitoring is, you know, obviously up to you, but uh, that's a, some tips. And once again, here's the reporting line. So that's it for my slides. Um, I know I think we're going to take questions at the very end. That was the plan, right? That's 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 the plan. Okay. So that that's good. You're right on right on time. I was about to bring down the gavel. You were perfect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. I wasn't even timing it. Okay. So um, Jody had some problems, but I see she's back on. So that's great. <clears throat> so Jody Watson's a supervisor of environmental stewardship and initiatives for the Capital Region District. He works on several environmental initiatives and projects designed to protect, enhance, and restore harbor and watershed ecosystems. Her group facilitates several multi-stakeholder environmental initiatives, such as Bowker Creek Initiative, Gorge Waterway, Esquimalt Lagoon Stewardship, the Sandwich Peninsula Harbors and Waterways, which she'll be speaking to tonight, and the Capital Region Invasive Species Partnership. So um, Jody's busy. We really appreciate her taking the time to be with us tonight. 
And I note that their unit is also coordinates public outreach for water conservation, stormwater, regional source control, harbors, watershed stewardship, invasive species and biodiversity. So uh, thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Jody. And we really, as I said, we really appreciate you helping us out with this evening. You may have to go All right, on. unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah. And you can see the presentation? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Bob, for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Sandwich Peninsula Harbors and Waterways Initiative and let you know some of the activities that we've been up to, uh, specifically around boats. I'll speak most uh, about that. Um, and then I look forward to the discussions at the end. Oh, I just need to move. Um, so the CRD service for the Saanich Peninsula Harbors and Waterways Initiative was established in March of 2021 at the request of the three municipalities. The overall purpose of the service is to coordinate and implement harbors, water bodies, water courses, environmental protection and improvement initi initiatives on and surrounding Saanich Peninsula. And the kinds of activities that are defined in the service include monitoring, mapping, reporting, and public education. Uh, coordination and collaboration with public authorities and others. And, oh, this is funny, I can't quite see my whole slide here. <clears throat> oh, this is smaller. Oops. Um, so the resources, uh, that are provided to the initiative. It's cost shared by the three municipalities. And uh, what it provides is about a day a week for coordination plus, you know, around $20,000 for projects or, or funds. There's a working group. Um, currently it's local government. First Nations are coming to the table at the next meeting. Uh, and we hope to continue expanding that. So the areas of focus, what I'll talk about tonight are the areas of focus that we've had for 2021. Um, how, and, and then finish with talking about how the community might be able to get involved. So as everyone knows, uh, we are on uh, Wasamich Nation uh, traditional territory uh, represented by Sakem, Sartlet, Sout and Bokwachin. Uh, the Douglas Treaty is in effect on the Sandwich Peninsula, which gives these nations the right to hunt and fish as formerly. However, um, many land uses and decisions of the past have, have uh, made it such that shellfish harvesting is closed and other uh, food harvesting and uh, traditional and cultural um, activities have been infringed upon. So we have, as we came together under the initiative, it was determined that it was very, very important to try and engage with uh, the Wasanich nations. Um, this is a brand new service for the CRD, and uh, there's a real desire to have the Wasanich nations as part of uh, the service and, and really helping to form what that looks like so that we can try and do things a little bit differently. Um, so we did presentations to the Wasanich Leadership Council. Uh, we invited all four of the nations to participate in the service. Uh, we've heard back. There's very strong interest in participating, although uh, we're trying to look at some capacity issues and trying to come up with some solutions to resolve some, resolve some of the capacity issues uh, to enable the nations to participate. We have started building relations. Uh, we've had several meetings with leadership and staff at the four nations to better understand their concerns and desires for these areas. Um, we're hosting tomorrow actually a meet and greet with uh, the local government and First Nations staff so that uh, at a staff level, they can kind of get to know each other, who's doing what and have a contact um, that, they, that they know um, to be able to collaborate with and, and working through. 
um, Dave Paul, who's on this on this call tonight, he is the CRD liaison to the Wasanich Nations. Um, he's going to be starting to attend the working group with the local government staff, and we're hoping that a representative from Bokachin will also attend. Um, and one of the first things that we'll work towards is is developing a terms of reference, and I don't know if that's the, the appropriate word, um, that's going to help define how we'll work together, identify maybe principles and priority focus areas um, of things that we want to collaborate. Mm -hmm. I suspect there could be a bit of process involved um, once we get that completed. Um, I'm sure that there will need to be some discussions back with the nations as well as the local government staff may have to have discussions um, uh, with mayor and council. Um, as we as we proceed forward. The other thing that uh, we've done some work on uh, is the three municipalities are really looking for a more coordinated approach to harbour and shoreline management and stewardship. Um, so as as most of you I'm sure know and have been quite involved in the um, public consultation around the development of the official community plans for these three municipalities. Central Saanich has has been 80% draft out. So we conducted a review of that. Uh, some of the actions and policies assigned within that um, are assigned to the uh, Harbors Initiative. Um, and it, some of the feedback that we're giving back to the municipalities is, is um, trying to encourage a clearer Harbor vision that can help guide um, the, all the work that um, we'll be collaborating on through this initiative. So another um, thing that we've been discussing at the table has been an ecological inventory. So there's some potential collaborations that, that we're hoping that um, uh, we can pursue. So in the core harbor areas, uh, we've just completed or we're almost completed doing uh, an intertidal inventory that uses high res orthophotos unsupervised classification and then ground truthing. Oh, I see I have a spelling error. Ground truthing, um, and that's used to develop a detailed inventory. In that project, we're also going to um, assign an ecological rating or an ecological value to all of the pieces of the shoreline. Um, so there's interest in other local governments around the region to complete an intertidal inventory for the shoreline area. It's certainly already been identified as a need, um, both within the bioregional framework and uh, in the initial draft of the OCP. Um, so we're just having discussions to see if there might be possibilities that we can kind of get almost like a sub-regional intertidal inventory. And that would also support a whole bunch of biodiversity planning and processes that are ongoing at, at various local governments. Um, the bioregional framework, um, I just want to do a shout out to all of those groups that were involved. I know Bob was uh, really involved in helping to lead that process. Um, and that is a, a really amazing framework document. And, and I certainly hope that, um, that you guys continue that work. There's some great information in there. And um, I think it really does provide a really good framework for looking at um, you know, the ecology and the ecosystem services that, that exist uh, on Saanich Peninsula. This is just an image um, kind of showing some of the detailed inventory. So, so again, it's taken from orthos. We got high res orthos flown at the lowest tide we possibly could. Uh, and then we've been going through a process with consultants who've uh, developed the detailed inventory. So we'll be able to get um, basically shape files of some pretty key ecological features um, in the harbor. Uh, so this is this is the just an example of of what we're hoping to be able to do. The other inventory, Pacific Salmon Foundation, uh, they have received a grant and they're looking at doing an inventory that's primarily focused on defining altered shorelines as well as overhanging vegetation and uh, forage fish beach uh, potential um, on the eastern coast of Vancouver Island. So, so we've also had some discussions with them and are looking at you know, how can we share information and support each other's process.
I can totally not see the slide, the title of my slide here. Uh, what does this say? Action. Action on vote issues. Thank you. Vote issues. I should know, given the given the picture. Uh, so we've we've been fairly busy on on vote issues. So we have met with uh, representatives from SIPS and the Seam Harbor Task Force to hear the concerns and better understand their issues, uh, the issues. Uh, we got a great harbor tour of Seam Harbor. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. And it was very, very eye-opening. Um, it, it, I mean, it's it's a whole different story when you're out on the water and really seeing up close and personal um, the condition of some of uh, the vessels there. We've also had several discussions with numerous federal and provincial agencies and local government staff, including Central Saanich Police. Uh, we've done. Uh, an inventory based off of the 2021 uh, high-res ortho photos with our, our GIS staff. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and we've also done a, a drone flyover. And then uh, in December, we, we brought all of the government agencies together as well as uh, First Nations representative. And we talked all about, you know, what are everybody's different jurisdictions? What are the... The possible avenues for local governments to deal with this um, and I'll get more into that in a little bit. Uh, so this is just an example of the inventory that we did. So uh, based off the, the high-res 2021 ortho photos, uh, we had our GIS people go in and identify every single boy they could see and we've started a database and this database through a PDF, you can actually, it'll give you the GPS location so we can actually take that PDF file, expand the information that we want, go to, this, go to the location, know that we're at the actual right boy, get the information that we need for that and the same thing with boats. Um, so we've done that for both Seam Harbor and Brentwood Bay, which is where we have the highest proliferation of boats. We also uh, put the, um, the designated uh, navigation lanes on, and, and as you can clearly see in both instances, there are several vessels that uh, are, are infringing upon those uh, navigation just a, a bit of a summary of that. So within the two different harbors, and we do have to do some ground truthing on this because I know for a fact that um, some of the boys that are located there are actually channel marking boys. So we do need to go in and, and do a bunch of work on this. Um, but basically we've got about 113 boys in, um, Seam Harbor, 110 in Brentwood Bay, and I took a look in Todd Inlet, and there's another 29 there. Um, and then I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of information about the private mooring boys in, in terms of all the legislation. I've got another half hour presentation I could do on that later. Um, but basically, um, most of the issues that stem around bo boats in these two harbors are as a result of private mooring boys. Um, because the private mooring boys are there, it's becoming a big parking lot for boats. Uh, so we also looked at the number of boats on a private mooring boy, and according to, I think it's the Minor Works Act, or it might be the, the mooring boy regulations, I can't quite recall at this moment, uh, you're only to have one boat that's less than 12 meters on a buoy and uh, there are several instances where there are multiple boats. Uh, the, the winner is in Brentwood Bay where there was nine boats on one uh, mooring buoy. Uh, I didn't put in this, this presentation how many boats there are, but um, I think there was about 200, and, no, there had 214 boats, I think, between the two. Um, so the next steps there are to work with federal and provincial staff to try and resolve via policy um, or there's consideration of lobbying senior government officials for policy change, particularly around private mooring boys. Um, Jillian is uh, really helping to drive kind of collaborative enforcement between uh, navigation protection program, Coast Guard, RCMP, Office of Boating and Safety, Police, 
the hope is that they can schedule regular multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency patrols. Um, local governments, it's really important for the local governments to determine whether or not they want boats and PMBs in their harbors because the approach to deal with that uh, depends on the answer to that question. So if yes, then um, the, the most logical route, it seems, is to consider a license of occupation and an, an act associated bylaws uh, that can regulate them or poten and potentially charge fees to manage the moorage. The reason that an LOO is required in that situation is only because if a municipality wants to charge some sort of fees to manage the moorage, they must have an LOO in place in order to do that. If they don't want to charge fees, they don't have to have an LOO. They can just kind of let it go as is, I guess. Um, but if local governments don't want a proliferation of boats, then they need to enact bylaws. They either prohibit them or say, here's where they can go and here's the number that we will allow. Um, local governments within their meets and bounds have the ability to create these sorts of bylaws and some of them already have. Um, and then they need to dedicate resources to enforce and, and move the boats out. And that, that's always a challenge, um, particularly for smaller municipalities. Um, so the next thing that uh, the local governments would like to do is have another session with other local government staff who've already put in place these sorts of things um, to come and share their experiences and help inform the process. So how can the community get involved? I know this is a, a big issue in, in both of the communities, Brentwood Bay Community and Seam Harbor. Um, so myself and Jillian um, are going to need some assistance with this boat and PMB inventory. So there's a lot of details to fill in. Um, you know, while we have a harbors initiative, we don't actually have a boat. So it's really hard for us to get out and, and uh, you know, get out to the boats and, and start getting some of that information so that we can start having a better understanding of, you know, how long the boats are here as an example. Um, what, if they've got any markings, what color they are so that we can keep better track. Um, continuing to report to the appropriate agency your concerns and I think Jillian gave you some good information around the abandoned boats or, or hazardous vessels and vessels of concern. Um, you guys are doing some great work advocating and educating and, and I would uh, encourage you to continue that. Um, there could be some more direction I think in the OCP regarding boats and, and private mooring boys that would really help to guide uh, the work of the initiative as well as the work of the community. Um, and I know the Pacific Salmon Foundation, when they get their inventory going down in this part of uh, the east coast of Vancouver Island, they're going to need local volunteers that have knowledge um, of, of these areas that can help to ground truth uh, the video that they're going to have. And I'll just finish with a, a smile and a I know how frustrated everybody is around this issue. And I know that there has been years of work that have, have gone on by community members. And I would ask for patience because it's a very complex issue. And it's not one that is necessarily easily solved, but I think that, um, I think that, you know, we've brought together a group that, that uh, is really looking to figure out how there's some collaborative solutions. So 